For those that are going to follow along this morning, we're going to spend our time in John 1, starting at verse 29. If you want to follow, you can follow on your phone. Bibles are all, all good ways to follow this morning. And we're going to stick pretty close to 29 through 42. Um, when I was in second grade, uh, there was a, a, a boy in the class who was what we might call in the, the, he was just kind of rude. He was in the bully category, but not quite, you know. And, and birthday parties are a big deal when you're in elementary school. We're discovering this. And, and we've, tried, we've tried to make them kind of small fun affairs because, you know, when you get like nine kids, it's a mess, right? So just a couple. Let's just have a couple. Second grade, this little boy, he wanted to invite everybody to his birthday party. It was a roller skating party, so, of course, everybody wanted to go, right? It had the Swiss cake roll, ice cream cake. This was a good deal. We all decided we'd go, even though most of the class really didn't want to be around him because he was mean. But we all went. We all had a good time. And then we discovered his motives later. As my birthday came up, I remember him coming up to me and saying, I invited you to my birthday party. You better invite me to yours. Now, I was smart enough to realize, no, I don't. I don't have to invite you to mine. That's not how it goes. I probably had a little more anxiety as a second grader about it because that's how it was back then. But, but here's the thing, right? He, he, the motive was obviously there. He wanted to be invited. That's why he did it. He knew this was not going to happen any other way, so he invited everybody so he would at least get an invitation. And it, it begs the question, doesn't it feel good to be invited to something? I mean, I like being invited. I get invitations to things I can't go to all the time. Sometimes I can't. But it feels good to be included and invited into something. And so today, we encounter an invitation from Jesus Christ in this text in John, which is a text that's very special and important to me and, and it has been an important part of my own faith with Jesus Christ. Last week, we were looking at Jesus and his baptism. We encountered John the Baptist. And, and as you look at that, we talked about sort of what was accomplished with the baptism of Jesus, what he was doing, John's reaction. We talked about blocking versus accepting uh, when it comes to God's work sort of around us and even through us. But there's a sense in which even as you look at the baptism of Jesus and ask those questions, you can keep things at arm's length a little bit. This week, we got John the Baptist again in play. Jesus is right there, but Jesus asks a question. And we can no longer keep Jesus at arm's length at this point. You're, you're asked to respond. You, you have to respond. You are responding, even if you're not responding, to what Jesus says. All of a sudden, we're invited into something with Jesus in this text. And so John the Baptist, we were talking about him last week. He looks different. He's on the raw food diet. He wears very interesting clothing. He preached forcefully, very forcefully. I love the way that John preaches, although I wouldn't want to be on the other end of it. I'd want to be faithful and obedient in the right way. And, and he's talking to the Pharisees and Sadducees saying, you brood of vipers who told you to flee the coming wrath. He preaches the Holy Spirit and fire, right? That there's judgment coming, which could be good, if you're saying yes, as we've discovered to the invitation Jesus would give, but could be bad if you don't. And we'll see some of that pointed out in the verses that we'll see later on from John. John comes and he baptizes. And he baptizes for cleansing and repentance. And, and the whole point of what he's trying to do is to say, be ready, be clean. What we've been waiting for is about to happen. And you've got to be ready to see it or you're going to miss it all. That's what he's preparing us for. And last week, the point we made was that saying yes to God, God's work, means sharing in God's promise. But let's be more pointed about what that really is and what that really looks like. It's actually saying yes to Jesus means sharing in God's promise and promises. And John testifies to that very fact. So we read. Let's read John 1, and we'll, we'll read 29 through 35 to begin with, or 34, actually, excuse me. We read this. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. 
I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. An important point that I would like to make is that, uh, and scholars will make all kinds of things of this, and, and in the right direction, I think. They say, he says, John says, I myself did not know him. The text seems to clearly indicate, well, he knew who he was. He could recognize him. I myself did not know him. In this moment, it is revealed by God to John that this is the chosen one. That's what's being revealed. I didn't know that he was that one, but now I did. It was revealed, and now he's testifying to us. That's really the point behind what's going on. It's worth noting. But John says, look, some of your translations might have behold. He says, here's the Lamb of God. I preached this very text as one of the first when I came here three and a half years ago uh, because there was kind of a blank slate, and this was an important text to me, and I wanted you to know that. So we talked about that back then. And I remember researching this back then and thinking, if I just do a, a search for Lamb of God, you know, on my Bible software, it's just going to be all over the place as a package term. I don't know if you've ever tried it. You don't find it very many places. As a package term, Lamb of God, you really only find John the Baptist using it and the book of Revelation using it. Other than that, the concept is there, certainly. But John uses it and Revelation uses it. Revelation uses it specifically more on the, the accomplished work of Christ, the victorious Christ. The Christ seated on the throne, that Lamb of God. John uses it much more in a, a preparatory, the beginning of the journey sense. The sin-removing, cleansing sense of what the Lamb of God does in our lives. So completed work versus the actual preparation for what Jesus is going to do now that you're clean. That's the difference. And it's only used in those couple instances. But but the language of lamb is clearly there throughout the whole of the Old Testament. It's built into the world that John the Baptist is preaching to and that Jesus is born into and becomes the lamb of God for. And so where we encounter that in a strong, strong way that, that lives in the cultural context for the Jewish people is in Exodus 12. And I'll read a little chunk of it in a moment. But there are nine plagues in to the let my people go sequence of being released from bondage in Egypt. They don't know it's necessarily if it's going to happen. They're still waiting. Moses is going to Pharaoh. Nine plagues have come and gone. The land is ultimately, is, is really just kind of decimated. The, the, they really have very little food, very little anything left. And yet Pharaoh's heart is hard. And then this tenth plague comes, the death of the firstborn. And when it's presented to the Hebrew people, to Moses, it's presented as, this is now the beginning of your year. You mark your year by this event. When death passed over, when the spirit of, when that angel of death was held back, And it's supposed to start in the month of Nisan, which is March and April, so springtime. They're supposed to have uh, a lamb that they prepare within the family. If you don't have enough people in your family, get the neighbors to come in. It all tells them that in the text. Eat it in haste. Share it. Don't save any till morning. Have your bags packed and ready. Have your clothing adjusted so that you can move fast when the time comes. Because the Spirit is coming through and God's, God's hand will allow death to pass over if you've done what you need to do. Most importantly, mark your doorways with the blood of the Lamb. That's where the imagery is from. That's what they're supposed to celebrate year after year. So you can hear the words from Exodus 12, through 27. It says, take a bunch of uh, hyssop associated with cleansing. Dip it into the blood, that's of the lamb, in a basin and put some of the blood on the top and both sides of your door frame. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of your door frame and will pass over that doorway and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he promised, observe this ceremony. This isn't just the mark of this year. This is the mark of the beginning of every year for them. And, verse 26, when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? 
Then tell them it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when the, he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bowed down and worshipped. Now scholars see that Lamb of God uh, language that John the Baptist uses and some will say, yeah, it's clearly this. This imagery is what's being pointed to. And some will say, eh, it could be all over the place what they're pointing to. But it seems clear that it's this when you look at it, especially if you keep reading on in the book of John, uh, just a little bit beyond what we just read in, in chapter 2. Jesus goes into the temple and he, he overturns things. It's the famous temple incident that uh, marks a clear and decisive uh, change in how people dealt with Jesus. And it says it was near the time of the Passover. So we know it's near the time of the Passover. We know that John is using this distinctive language. It seems pretty evident that this is what's being referenced. This is the Lamb of God, John says. Something's about to happen. Mark your calendar. John says not just, look, behold, this is the Lamb of God, but this is the Lamb of God who's going to do something. He takes away the sin of the world. We heard from Isaiah 53 this morning. We get another indication of the the imagery and what's behind this and what would happen, what would be done by the Lamb of God who's going to take the sin of the world. You can read in there, all we like sheep have gone astray. Each has turned to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We know that to be Jesus. We read from 1 Peter this morning who picks up some of that very same imagery and says by, reminds us that by his wounds we have been healed. It's because the iniquity was laid on that lamb that we have life at all, that we can be clean of sin and free from that. Peter goes on to tell us that now then we are baptized as a pledge of a clear conscience towards God. That marks the new year in our life, that we come into this, that we say yes to Jesus Christ. Christ's resurrection saves us It's through the death and through the resurrection that we have these promises that we can be healed. And we see even in the baptism of Jesus that there's this anointing that goes on with Jesus so that he can do the work, that we can be clean. And we see something very important that comes out of this, that when we say yes to Jesus, and we'll see that in just a moment, that then we're actually called to do something that the Spirit does with Jesus, which is he abides on the Son. And so too, when we say yes to Jesus, we are to abide with Jesus Christ. All this is going to come into play in just a moment. We have the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, prepares it so we can even do that in the first place. That's where we're at so far. Now let's go on in the text. It continues on. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. This is John the Baptist. The two disciples, one is named, one most scholars assume is John, the guy who's writing the gospel. So when, they, when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. Same imagery. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said uh, and had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which, when translated, is Peter. Jesus gives an invitation right there to people who come and inquire. And I want to suggest to you that that invitation is not limited to John and to Andrew, but extends to us. Jesus invites you and me to follow him. That seems like a very basic point. They become his disciples. What is the disciple but somebody who is a learner? That's really what it translates out to be. Yeah, it's a follower, but more pointedly, and we talked about this in confirmation today, conveniently, it's somebody who learns. And what is the essential relationship that a learner has? What do they need? If you're going to be a learner or a student, maybe is the better way to ask it, you need a teacher. And you do well to never mix up those relationships. We're invited to follow Christ, to learn from Christ. 
not to lead Christ. That's fundamental, and that's a huge distinction, and we need to always keep in mind we follow Jesus Christ as his disciples when we accept that invitation. Part of what we should point out about disciples, and John Stott does this very well, and I've, I've used this in, in classroom settings, and I think it's worth our time this morning, that Jesus, when it comes to his disciples, this gets a little beyond the text, but it comes right back to it. There are three kind of useful things to know about Jesus and his relationship with his disciples. The first, which we do see clearly in the text, Jesus invites, he calls them. Even though they're inquiring, he's the one who actually gives the invitation to come and join. And our our language sometimes that we use in our culture doesn't, it it doesn't always work out that way. Uh, I was reading, um, if you'll indulge me, a paragraph here from a book. I was reading a book by a pastor I like, Daryl Johnson, who, who kind of points this out. And, and he points out this essential relationship, basically, that we are the ones who are following. We are the ones who are being taught by Jesus. And when we mix that up, that's when we run into problems. So he points this out well. Indulge me in this paragraph. He says, you can see in the Western world, we have a faulty view of discipleship. If I'm hearing us correctly, he says, this is what we believe. We are walking down the road, a road of our own choosing. The risen and ascended Jesus comes to us and intersects our lives. He offers us all the blessings and challenges of living with him in the kingdom of God. We like what he offers, so we accept him. We receive him. And we continue walking down our road, assuming that we will begin to experience kingdom life on that road. But soon we are disappointed. Things are not working like the word suggests they should. Some of us walk away from the call. Some of us just try harder to make things work, but they do not. For the simple reason that when the risen and ascended Jesus intersects our lives and calls us to follow him into the kingdom life, he calls us to a different road. We thought we could confess him as Lord and Savior and keep living the way we did when we were following other lords and would-be saviors. It does not work. The blessings of the kingdom only come on a new road. Repent, Jesus would tell us. Get off the highway you are on and follow me down a different path. Jesus invites us to something new, to something different, to life in him. Have you received your invite yet? Have you heard the invitation in your own life? And what did you do with it? Jesus invites us. The second thing about uh, Jesus and his relationship with this is his disciples. Is that his disciples are unqualified. Now John Stott says that I would, I would probably venture to say woefully unqualified at times. And if it extends to us, we are too very unqualified to be Jesus' disciples, we should say thanks be to God for that because he shapes us into something. We're not already there. And and you can see as you look at the disciples that they're unqualified at so many turns. Yeah, they recognize that there's something going on when they get this invitation from Jesus, the two that we run into. But, But boy, along the way, Jesus, are we the ones who get to sit at your right hand? Who will get to sit at your right hand? They don't quite get it. Well, one of my favorites, when he talks about beware the yeast of the Pharisees, and they say, well, it's because we didn't bring any bread. Or there's, uh, even at the end, after Jesus has resurrected and hung around with them for quite a long time, they say, are you now going to establish your kingdom? They just don't quite track with him at every turn. They seem unqualified for the job when you get down to it. And yet, and yet he takes those people, And he shapes them into something. He changes them. The Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. They come at his invitation, and he makes them new. He makes them into something that is qualified. And a lot of us will sometimes block and say no to Jesus, or to Jesus getting into certain areas, because we sort of disqualify Jesus from the task. I'm going to be judged, right? That's the mortal sin in our culture. I'll be judged if I come. I don't want to be judged by Jesus. That tells me that I'm wrong. He says, you are wrong. Come to me. I'll set you right. 
but that's a good thing in that case. We're unqualified for the task. And he says, I'll make you qualified. You'll be mine. Thirdly, readiness matters for the disciples. There are people that Jesus calls along the way who say, let me just do a couple other things first. And Jesus says, they're not fit for the kingdom. It's not going to work out. But you can see in the disciples that we're reading right here, they're ready. They might not know the fullness of the adventure they're going to get in on. They might be unqualified, but they hear the invitation. And they're ready to go for it. And if you really notice, we catch the first words of Jesus in the Gospel of John in this text we just read. And the first words of Jesus weren't, come and you will see. They're right before that. What does he say? What do you want? Readiness matters. He wants to know their intention. Even at another point in the Gospels, Jesus will ask a man who's been sick for a long time, do you actually want to be healed? What do you want? Jesus asks us. He gives us the invitation. We're unqualified for the task, but then he asks, are you ready for what I'm offering you? Are you ready for this massive change that's about to happen to your life? And this is where the text intersects with my own life and my own story. And many of you have heard it on different occasions, but it's it's worth pointing out again, at least in my mind, that, that for me, I grew up in the church. I came to know Jesus at a young age. I've always loved the church. I've always been very involved. But even in studying, going to Bible college and then studying biblical and theological studies was my major. Five weeks out from graduating from that, I'd realized I made the Bible a textbook and my faith was dry. I, I had a desire to know Jesus. That's why I was doing it. But I had made it just this academic endeavor. And so it was dry. And I felt dry. And it's at that point that God reached right in and it was as if an audible voice said, you know, you've been trying to give me a part of you, but I want all of you, Evan, and I want you now. An invitation. To which I could only say yes, and the adventure began. And then when I married Stephanie, we continued on that adventure and we have had to, uh, we've been asked and called and invited to do many things by God which involved relocating, which always cost an excessive amount of money to relocate, by the way. And we've had to leave friends behind and make new friends and say bye to family and hello and bye and hello, and the cost comes with that, but it's been worth the adventure to simply say and respond to Jesus when he says, come and you're going to see. We say, I want this, I'm ready. And Jesus says, come and see where I'm staying. Come and abide, as it turns out, with me. So the lamb takes away the sin of the world. The lamb takes away your sin and my sin. We say yes to Jesus. And then the adventure begins with the invitation of Jesus. And we have to be ready for that. But we have to recognize it's bedrock change that we're asking for. It's bedrock change that we're being invited to. Are you ready for that bedrock change in your reality? With the invitation that comes with Jesus. Following Jesus just means fundamental change to who we are. We're unqualified. Jesus qualifies us. He says, I'm going to make you into something beyond your wildest expectations. You look at Andrew, who tells Peter, we found the one. There's already a testimony. They're excited about what's going on. Andrew recognizes he's ready. He says, okay, I, I see that there's, this is the one we've been waiting for. Peter, you look at Peter, and I, the part of the reason I used part of 1 Peter and just talking to you this morning was you look at the monumental change that happens in his life. If you keep following his life by accepting invitation, he's a completely different man by the time Jesus is done with him, the rock on which the church is built. That's Peter. All because the disciples not just chose to behold the lamb, they chose the blood of the lamb, and then they chose to abide with the lamb. They, they prepared, they were ready, and they stayed with him. And that's the key to the whole thing. John, in the book of John, he uses the term abide about 40 different times in in a number of different ways it gets translated. Abide, remain, those are different ways. We saw it already in our text this morning that the Holy Spirit would come down and abide on him. It says remain, but that's the same word. It sticks with him. It doesn't leave him. So too, we're invited by Jesus to come on this great adventure, to be clean, to come on the adventure, and then abide with him and stick with him. 
no matter what happens. And that's how it plays out. Now, we can see abide or remain used in uh, positive and negative ways in Scripture in the book of John specifically. So let's look at a couple of those because I want us to catch what, what adventure we're called to and how we're supposed to live it out when Jesus says, come and you're going to see. Positively and negatively, in John 3, 36, it says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. That's good. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath, what? Remains on them. That's the abide word. It abides. That's when it's a bad way. That God's wrath doesn't, is, is not just aimed at sin, but then has to, it ends up hitting the person because we haven't allowed the blood to wash us. That the sin is still there. We're not clean. Another one that's got positive negative in it. John 5, 37 and 38. Jesus is saying these words, and he's speaking to the Sadducee, or Pharisees, excuse me, specifically. He says, the Father has sent me, uh, the Father who has sent me sent himself testified concerning me. That's good. You have heard his voice, or you have heard his voice, nor seen his form, never heard his voice, nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you. For you do not believe the one he sent. That word dwell is the remain word. But that's part of the invitation. You saw everything else. You were paying attention to everything else, but you rejected the one he sent. That's Jesus, the one who invites you and me into that relationship that we would remain with him. Jesus came to redeem you and me that we could remain with him. And yet it's easy to to come to Jesus to say yes to, to pray the prayer, to, to be saved, but not do anything else sometimes, or close off or wall off parts of ourselves to what Jesus wants to change and transform inside of us, because Jesus didn't come to just make us a better version of ourselves. He came to make us a new creation who we were supposed to be, free from sin. Positively. And here's four remains in one verse. If you were looking for it, you've now found it. In John 15, 4, Jesus says it. He says, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must, what? Remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. It turns out that God's promise that we're uh, called to share in when we say yes to Jesus is God's presence. We get that through the power of the Holy Spirit. We get that through Jesus Christ. We're called into that. We're called to abide is what we're called to do. Behold, be clean, and then abide. One point before I kind of close things out here. When we're reading the text this morning, it says that they went to Jesus after he, he said, what do you want? He says, come and you will see. What time of the day is it? The 10th hour, some of your translations have, 4 o'clock, mine had. Why does it even bother telling us the time? Because that's closing time. That's when things are shutting down and people are transitioning to, to what's coming next, to where you're going to stay for the night. So by going with Jesus towards the end of the day, they're saying, we're going to learn from you. We're going to abide with you. They're going to have extended conversation with Jesus, being in his presence. We're supposed to abide with Jesus in the exact same way. To say yes to Jesus is a commitment to follow and to abide. And it's because of that that saying yes to Jesus means sharing in God's promises. For some of us, it seems elementary to cover all of this, but it's worth covering all of this. Some of us, maybe, we've never said yes to Jesus. Some of us, we've said yes to Jesus, but it's been so long we haven't reconsidered or considered recently what it was we were saying yes to. For some of us, it's hard to abide. We need to hear this, that we've got to abide with the person, Jesus Christ, to be in his presence. So today, as we're here together, behold the Lamb. Recognize what it is that Jesus has done and calls you to. This morning, as we're together, accept the invitation to come and see what Jesus will do in your life and mine. And right now, may we abide with Jesus Christ, the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Let's pray together.
Our Father, may we be content in your presence. May we not be so distracted that we simply have to do, but that we can't be with you. Father, help us have the essential relationship that we need with your Son, Jesus Christ, that we would abide, that we would want to know Jesus Christ and Him crucified, that we would want to know the power of the resurrection, the victory of the Lamb, that we'd not only want to experience the passing over of death, that we could have life that is truly life, but that it would start now. And that by abiding with your Son, Jesus Christ, we could experience the power of your Spirit in this world to testify as John or as Andrew does. To experience fundamental and complete change on this amazing adventure that Peter does. To be transformed into the likeness of your Son, Jesus Christ, because we chose to stay with him, not simply to pray the prayer, but to walk together on the road he asks us to walk on. God, help us count the cost, but help us see the benefit. Help us see the blessing. Help us understand the promise that you give us of your presence in Jesus Christ. For those of us that block that presence, tear down the walls. For those of us that don't realize where we block the presence, illuminate those areas. For those of us that just want more, God, out of you, and want to experience your presence everywhere we go, May we please have your presence this morning. We pray this all in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.